Thank you all for coming. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about how you can speed up your reinforcement learning experiments using RLib plus Ray. Most notably, we got a 24x speed up for our experiments, and we'll be talking about why we got such large uh, speed ups. Um, and yeah, so my name is Raul Corey. I'm a quantitative software engineer at the, on the AI Core team at Two Sigma. On that team, I work on applied research as well as consulting with other company, uh, other teams around the company. Um, and a lot of that applied research uh, is in reinforcement learning. Before my time at Two Sigma, uh, I studied my undergrad and my master's at MIT in AI and computer science. Um, and this is my dog, Bowie the Samoyed. Uh, if you want to, you can follow him on Instagram. There's his handle. Um, for those of you who don't know what Two Sigma is, um, we're a financial scientist company. We coined that term actually last year. Um, prior to that, we were just an investment manager, but we've started to do a lot more than just that. We've done a lot of other financial data-driven endeavors, including insurance, real estate, private equity, um, and many more. The company was founded in 2001 by our CEOs, John and David, and we have roughly 2,000 employees, so about 1,000 engineers and 250 researchers. Um, and so the company is very uh, data-driven, very STEM-focused, um, and a lot is devoted to the scientific process. Um, and we have offices in New York, London, Houston, Tokyo, and Shanghai, um, in New York being the largest office. And this is our New York office that I haven't been in since March 2020, and I miss it a lot. I'm excited to go back. Um, because we're a financial services company, I do have to show the, uh, our legal disclaimer, um, which we can skip now. Um, so what are we going to be talking about today? Well, we're going to be talking about RLlib. Um, so you know, a lot of my applied research, or my team's applied research, uh, c currently includes reinforcement learning. Um, and we recently, or I guess in mid-year uh, 2020, um, migrated from stable baselines to RLlib. Um, and for those of you who don't know what stable baselines is, it's an open source reinforcement learning library that uh, forked from the baselines open source reinforcement learning package uh, out from OpenAI. Um, and so we, we migrated from stable baselines to RLlib. We learned a lot. We got a 24x speed up. We're going to be talking about the lessons learned we did from that migration, as well as this case study of uh, that, that experiment and why it got such a large speed up. Uh, so first of all, before we, you know, we don't dive right into that, let's talk about the RL pipeline or just a general overview so we have the same jargon. Um, so normally you have what's called a trainer or an agent, and it's responsible for learning a policy or figuring out how to interact with the environment. So it applies actions to some simulator or an environment and outcome observations and rewards. And this environment is basically the state machine, right? So actions go in and observations and rewards come out. Um, and there, you can imagine that there's a lot of interactions required in order to get the, uh, the, the agent of that policy to learn a good uh, policy in that environment. Um, so you, many times you need tens of millions or maybe hundreds of millions of interactions and you need to learn on all of those. And so we can think about what are the possible bottlenecks in that pipeline, right? So there's a possibility that you have a bottleneck in learning or optimization. So basically you've collected all those samples and now you're trying to learn a good policy on that. But there's also um, you know, a bottleneck in the time it takes to basically sample from that environment, basically stepping through the environment can kind of be a bottleneck. Um, and so very different bottlenecks. Um, today we're actually going to be focusing on sample bound RL or basically um, RL uh, experiments that have a, uh, kind of a, an, an environment that is bottlenecking the experiment. Uh, there's a really good scaling guide on the RLlib documentation that I included the link here, um, where they talk about you know trade-offs, what algorithms you should use and consider. Um, but today we're going to kind of deep dive into the sampling and especially our experiment and why it benefited from you know this migration and the techniques we used. So let's talk about our experiment. Um, so we deal with financial data, not a uh, you know a classic physics simulator or something else you might see um, in, a, in a normal RL package. Um, so there's a lot of financial data. And there's low signal to noise ratio when you're dealing with financial data. Um, this often really slows down experiments. And so the experiment we're going to be talking about, we're focusing on today, was taking about seven to 10 hours to complete or to get stability that we wanted. Um, and you can imagine that's pretty restrictive. Uh, you know, it basically takes overnight or an entire workday. Um, and well, these, uh, these experiments have low noise, uh, signal to noise ratio and that you can imagine you need a lot of seeds, you need a lot of experiments because it's financial data. And so 
this was a really restrictive for our research. I mean, I guess maybe for classic deep learning, this isn't too bad, but for us, this was kind of uh, very cumbersome. Um, and this was already using 24 CPUs on stable baselines. Um, and, you know, looking at the metrics of our experiments, we were seeing that, you know, learning was only taking about 10% of the time, where the other 90% was basically interacting with that environment or generating those samples. So, you know, what, what, what did we try at first? Um, so, you know, classic deep learning problem, we throw GPUs at the problem. We, you know, that classic silver bullet, we were like, yeah, well, GPU speed it up, but actually it yielded little to no speed up. Um, and I guess this may be surprising, but um, I guess it's not because the simulators don't use GPUs. And so throwing GPUs at the problem isn't going to speed up our simulators. Um, it might have sped up, you know, maybe the inference of the learning, but in our case, the simulation of that kind of stepping through the environment was, was really slowing us down. Um, and then on top of that, the GPUs were very expensive, so it was not worth uh, using those GPU machines. Um, I do remember in the conference last year, um, you know, someone in, during the Q&A basically said, hey, uh, you know, I got a, a larger machine with a GPU and I'm not really seeing any speed up. Um, and I remember it was like, oh yeah, like, you really need to scale your, you know, your number of CPUs. You really need to scale your experiment. The GPUs aren't the silver bullet for RL as they are. I mean, aren't, isn't always the silver bullet in RL as it is in a lot of other deep learning problems. Um, so the other thing we actually tried is to use more CPUs. Um, you know, at the time we were kind of constrained to 24 CPUs, but we, we were able to find some larger boxes. Um, but we found that actually we weren't getting good scaling with stable baselines at the time. Um, and so we were getting little to no speed up, even going to 48 or 96 uh, CPUs. Um, and then the next thing, you know, some people were trying, saying, well, you know, if you're, you know, you have a slow simulator, why don't you guys try off policy? Um, unfortunately, we were getting lower solution quality than the on policy algorithms. And so, you know, we could still complete the on policy learning. So we were just like, okay, we might as well continue with these. Um, but, you know, it's still, uh, and the off policy algorithms still took a while to train. So it, it, we weren't really considering them. We wanted to stay on policy. Um, and so midway through last year, someone recommended to us that we should try RLlib. Um, and so, you know, okay, you know, it seems like an interesting technology, has a lot of dis ability to distribute, let's try it. Um, so we migrated over to RLlib. Um, and actually, since the, uh, you know, our, our simulator was already using the generic GIM API, the migration was actually pretty easy. The envi uh, I personally think during uh, reinforcement learning research, the hardest part is the simulator. And so if we could just easily migrate that, that was a lot of the work kind of done for us. Um, the only hard part, I guess, was basic. Oh, the nice thing is that stable baselines, uh, RLlib had a super set of the algorithms that we had or cared about in stable baselines. Um, the only kind of difficult thing is that we did need to make small changes to our hyperparameters in order to get the same solution quality. But we were able to eventually get the same solution quality. And the nice thing is that Tune managed our experiments and we were able to use Tune for hyperparameter optimization in order to find those hyperparameter tweaks in order to get the same solution quality. Um, and so in total, the migration only took us about a week, um, which was you know, pretty painless in my opinion. Um, and also there was great community support uh, and as well as a lot of RLlib examples in their GitHub repository, which I think if you're doing the migration or you're trying RLlib for the first time, you should really check out. Um, so, you know, we finally migrated, we got the same solution uh, quality, um, and then we basically decided, okay, now let's benchmark, you know, the runtime of the experiments. So this is why we kind of did this migration. Um, so, you know, on the x-axis here, we plotted the number of CPUs we gave the experiment, and on the y-axis, you'll see the amount of time it took the experiment to take. Um, and what we really care about is how long it took on these 24 CPUs. And, you'll, you know, lower is better here. And basically, we, we were able to get our experiments from, you know, 7 to 10 hours um, down to basically 2 hours. Um, so that was a nice forex speed up. You know, our experiments took something overnight that now can, you know, can, can run pretty fast. Um, but I guess we were, you know, as, you know, AI for, you know, uh, you know, people with the data driven or people who are very interested in this, we were really curious of why, why was RLlib paralyzing better? Like, you know, in theory, it's doing the exact same thing. Why is it getting this forex speed up? Um, and what we found out is it actually comes out to the types of RL parallelization. So there's a type of parallelization that's vectorized environments. Um, and so basically during a vectorized environment or vectorized parallelization for an RL problem, what you do is you, you basically take all your environments and you put them together in a list or a vector. Um, and you, do, you apply everything in step to that vector of environments. So you, 
you will step them, you will reset them, you will push them through the, uh, the graph together. Um, and it's nice that, you know, everything is efficient in inference time, but the issue is that everything has to step together. And so if you have any variance in your step time, you actually have environments that are sitting there and waiting for the other environments. Um, and that's what we call as the lockstep issue. Um, and you're actually constrained to vectorize environments by many R libraries. Um, and so you can imagine a vectorized environment might look like this little blue box here, where you know you have, might have four, five environments, four of which stepped really quickly on that step, but one of the environments for some reason took 100 milliseconds. Um, and the entire vector is gonna take 100 milliseconds to do that step. And so you can imagine those four environments wasted potential to be continued stepping. So a lot of wasted potential in vectorized environments for this lockstep issue. Um, the other type of parallelization is batched rollouts. Uh, the main idea here is basically you give wor workers, you know, you, hey, go collect a thousand uh, samples, go collect a thousand samples. They all go collect them and they come back. You do have to wait at the end, but you don't have to wait at every single step. It's a little less efficient at inference, but since you sync at the end of the rollouts, you have a lot less waiting. Um, and you actually get to avoid a lot of this lockstep issue. And so you can imagine this might be what, what a batch environment might look at. You, you know, you don't really have an environment, but you have, you know, batch rollouts. And on average, you kind of get to diversify that 100 milliseconds. So three millisecond steps can still just continue rolling. Um, and so the lockstep issue is actually what was causing our stable baselines experiments to not paralyze well. And that's really what's slowing us down there. But what was actually, what was RLlib doing? Um, it's actually some interesting hybrid solution. See, in RLlib, you actually can choose the number, the what's called the number of rollout workers. And those rollout workers are basically the number of batch rollouts. So in this you know, sample experiment we have, we have four rollout workers kind of working in batched fashion. And then inside a rollout worker, you basically can have vectorized environments inside of a rollout worker. Um, and what this allows you to do is a lot of customization. So you can imagine this experiment here, as well as the experiment on the right are actually equivalent. Um, you know, they both have 12 environments um, you know, you would either have four or six rollout workers and, you know, three or two uh, vectorized environments, but you'll notice that on the environment on the right, you get a lot better speed up because you've diversified that, those slowdowns with that stop time. And, you, you know, you can tune this to get really fast results. So talking about, you know, tuning experiments, let's look at our experiment and the kind of the run times of some of those steps and see, you know, where we benefited a lot from. So, you know, in the overall performance of stable baselines versus RL lib, we were talking about earlier, you know, stable baselines, the optimization was taking less than 10% of the, the total, you know, overall iteration time. Um, but now that we've, we're on these batch environments, we'll see that that sampling time went down by, you know, a factor of seven or eight, um, basically now you know, a lot faster, saving us those six hours. Um, and if we look at what was going on inside of sampling, the resets between the vectorized and the batch were happening basically at the same amount of time. And, it, and it's interesting that the inference time stable baselines of the vectorized was actually running faster there. But what really made the difference was during steps. Uh, you know, what we were talking about earlier, um, the vectorized environments had very slow steps. And if you, if you, those 24 milliseconds, if you're doing, you know, 20 million samples, as we were doing for this experiment, that's wasting six hours here. Um, that's a lot of time wasted for just uh, CPUs waiting and doing no compute. It's a lot of wasted CPU capabilities. Um, so you can imagine this is what kind of like our environment looked like when we were in stable baselines um, with a lot of uh, wasted potential. Um, so when does a lockstep issue matter? Well, if you have non-uniform step time or resets times, like what we had in our experiments, um, I think you can expect some pretty large speed ups. You know, we got like a little bit over a 4x speed up, um, which was, you know, pretty amazing. Um, you can also imagine that it, this isn't just reset times that might be a problem. You know, if you have an environment where, let's say, um, you know, some steps are very simple, you know, maybe that you don't have to do anything during some type, type of steps, but other types of steps require, you know, a large optimization maybe to be run and re-optimizing the system. Um, you can imagine that, yeah, you're going to be suffering from the lockstep issue and you should really be considering, you know, avoiding a vectorized environment implementation of parallelization. Um, what also really matters is actually if you're going to large parallelization, um, you know, you actually have just, just regular variance in this time it takes to just calculate some uh, steps actually can, can sum up to a big slowdown. So most of our other experiments that weren't as, uh, as lockstep issuey as our original one, we're still getting about a 10 to 50% speed up from just uh, the regular migration on the same number of CPUs. Um, and in general, I think you can expect a speed up on 24 CPUs to be somewhere uh, around two times 
the uh, the step time divided the standard deviation of the step time divided by the mean of the step time. Um, and this basically assumes that that entire vector of environments is going to have to wait um, a certain number of Gaussian variants for basically the max of n Gaussians. So if you have 24, you're basically going to have to wait two Gaussian variants for all of them to complete. And so you know if you have two uh, if you have 24 environments, this can cause a, a significant slowdown. Um, so one of the really cool things about our migration to RLlib, or you know, the RLlib as a RL package, is that it also comes with ray clusters, and so this opens the door for you know really powerful distributed computing. Um, and I think this is one of the biggest selling points for RLlib as a you know an RL package. Um, so before we were comparing RLlib to stable baselines with just one box, what the really cool thing was when we you know introduced ray clusters now is we basically opened the right side of this graph. You know, we were able to add additional machines into our cluster for RLlib out of the box. You know, all we have to do is connect the machine to our cluster and not change our code at all. Um, and we were able to, you know, cut our experiment down um, incredibly. So um, when we uh, introduced, you know, 16x the number of machines, we were able to get our experiments down to 20 minutes, which hopefully is shorter than the time that took to do this presentation. Um, and so, you know, this completely changes our research cycles. You know, we were... In stable baselines, we were doing things that were taking overnight, whole days, where now we're taking things that are 20 minutes. Are we were able, we're able to research so much faster now with this technology? Um, yeah, so that's 6x speed up on 16x the CPUs, which uh, I think is a pretty amazing scaling. Um, so, you know, there are other, a lot of nice things when we migrated to RLib plus Ray. Um, you know, there's bonus features, I like to call them. Um, you know, the entire ecosystem has been really interesting. One of the things, uh, the favorite things is Tune. Um, just for the hyperparameter optimization, we were able to, you know, if we want to change our algorithm, it's really easy to, you know, switch to another algorithm and then run in the hyperparameter optimization so you can get really good apples to apples comparisons. Um, and it also just manages our experiments very nicely. We don't have to write any custom code. Um, there's also a large number of supported algorithms with RLlib. It had a superset of the algorithms we cared about in stable baselines and has many more, especially many multi-agent environments. It's been really great. Um, also, just the general Ray distributed compute platform has been useful for a lot of the engineers who are on our team. Um, just being able to use the, the, the scalability out of Ray has been very useful. Um, so in conclusion, migrating from stable baselines to RLlib, I think the mileage is going to vary depending on your experiment, especially how, you know, how much the lockstep issue matters. But you know, we were able to get a 4x speed up. I think it, you know, mileage is going to vary here. I think most people will get something around 10 to 50% speed up. Um, that's closer to what RLib, you know, boasts on their website. Um, and I think you really need to be aware of the environment parallelization you're using. You know, are you using vectorized? Are you using patched? Is the lockstep issue going to get you? Um, you should be well aware of that. We weren't originally. We were on stable baselines. Now that we're on RLlib and we kind of did this investigation, we're aware of it. And you know, 24x speed up, we're definitely aware of it now. Um, and the other really nice thing about RLlib is that it comes with ray clusters. Um, again, now this is going to vary here depending on, you know, on your experiment, but um, we were able to get another 6x speed up on 16x the number of CPUs, but we were able to get our experiments down from two hours down to 20 minutes. Um, and so this was, this was amazing. And I think most RL experiments that are simulation bound at least are going to really, really benefit from this. Um, and it's, it's very easy for, you know, to, to use the distributed compute of array clusters. Um, and so the really nice thing was, on top of that is that it's all commodity CPU only machines, which are relatively cheap compared to, you know, those big GPU machines that you're used to for many deep learning projects. Um, so together out of all this, you know, both those migrations, we were able to get our 24X speed up. Um, and I think the other really nice thing about this migration is that the ecosystem has been just a really nice bonus for us. Um, so, you know, before our experiments were slow on their back and now they're happy, fun and running. Um, thank you guys so much for coming to the talk and I'm ready to, you know, if we want to do any Q and A.